I tried very hard to be neutral in my depictions of it because the minute you start saying supposedly or allegedly or claimed or that kind of thing, then immediately you're basically distancing yourself from your subject and also judging your subject. So I knew if I was going to do this and really understand this person, I couldn't do that. A question asked courageously, answered honestly, and lived authentically can change your whole life. For me, that question was, how can I use what I have, what I love, and what I know to bless the lives of others? The School for Good Living and this podcast are one answer to that question. Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery, and sometimes the misery, of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Today, my guest is Brian C. Wilson, a professor of American religious history in the Department of Comparative Religion at Western Michigan University. But I was interested to talk with Brian for a few different reasons. First of all, Brian is a biographer. I haven't interviewed a biographer yet. I thought it might be interesting and fun, but not just any biographer. I wanted to talk to someone who had written a biography about someone that I was interested in. And this book, Johnny Fetzer and the Quest for the New Age, is a book about someone I'm interested in. Not only was John E. Fetzer one of America's great entrepreneurs, he made a fortune in broadcasting, he owned the Detroit Tigers, and he became a very generous philanthropist. John founded the Fetzer Institute, which is helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Not many people put a mission into terms like that. We'll talk about equality, we'll talk about social justice, Right, But to talk about a loving world, I thought that was really interesting. And reading this book, I was fascinated by John Fetzer's quest to better understand himself and life, spirituality. And of course, I talk with Brian all about this in the interview where John believed a lot of non-traditional things. If you're listening to this before December 31st, 2020, good news. If you want, you can receive a copy of this book free by visiting fetchertrust.org. Just fill out your information, they'll send you the book. So with that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Brian C. Wilson. Brian, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you, it's great to be here. Yes, I'm so glad you are. Will you tell me please, what's life about? Wow, what's life about? Finding your path, I think that's it. Everything else is an ambiguous mystery and it's about exploration and finding your path towards exploration. And of course, the ideal thing is to help others as you journey along your path. And so I guess if there are two things, this is gonna sound like a Monty Python routine, keep adding, adding <laughs> things, but the two major things is find your path. I mean, Joseph Campbell always used to talk about follow your bliss. It's important, yeah but it's also help others along the way. So I think those are the two main things. And beyond that, the great metaphysical questions, you know, I've devoted my life to studying them. I find them absolutely fascinating, but I don't have any big answers beyond that. Okay, we'll start from there. It sounds pretty good. When people ask who you are, what you do, how do you typically answer that? Typically, I, people ask me what I do, and I say I'm a professor of comparative religion. And when people are confronted with that, of course, the question then becomes, well, you compare religions, which one's the best? And that always <laughs> yes. initiates... Didn't, didn't South Park handle this already? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. But then, I mean, that always allows me to basically get into, well, you compare not to rank, but to understand. And so that's what I do. You know, in the classroom, I'm a university professor, you know, I've taught for 25 years. And essentially, the whole goal is not to convince my students of one position or one metaphysical outlook or one religion or one spirituality, but to get them to engage in a multiple, you know, kind of a wide view of the world and get to know what's out there. And for the students, it's eye-opening. In the classes, it's always about understanding before judgment. That's the key. 
Now, once you step out of the classroom, you're going to want to make, you know, your own evaluations and judgments and decide what your path is. But in the classroom, it's all about keeping your mind open and, you know, exploring and trying to, you know, see the world through other people's eyes, which is so rewarding, but so difficult. Yeah, that's right. I love the brevity of that understanding before judgment. That's really a beautiful thing. How did you go from what you studied in your undergraduate at Stanford, medical microbiology, to becoming a professor of comparative religion? Well, it definitely wasn't a straightforward path. I always had this idea that I wanted to do the sciences, but I also wanted to serve. So it made perfect sense that going into medicine would be the best way of combining both those things. And so when I was at Stanford, there was a wonderful medical microbiology program. It's very small. And I got a lot of attention from the professors and had a wonderful time. But after four years, I kind of thought, well, you know, I live a pretty sheltered existence. I mean, if I go directly into medical school at this point, you know, that's it. I'm kind of locked into a career and that's it. And so I decided to stop at that point and take some time off. And I joined the Peace Corps. And that was kind of the turning point. Because after that experience, my life took a completely different turn. They sent me down to Honduras for two years. And, you know, I had to struggle with Spanish. And my job was to teach people how to grow freshwater fish, tropical fish and fish ponds. Because of my biology background, they thought I could do that. Uh, well, that was a complete bust. But you get down there and you find out, well, the whole point of the Peace Corps is not to, you know, save the world or, you know, develop the foreign nations or whatever you, you know, idealistic thing you have in your mind. But it's to get you exposed to other cultures and have other people see you. And that was the most important thing about that experience. And so, yeah, two years in Honduras and traveling around Central America. And this was you know, just a blast. So eye opening, you know, a kid from California. And then after that, I decided I didn't have enough of it. So I re-upped for another year and they sent me off to the Dominican Republic, which was a whole different culture, a whole different situation in the Caribbean which was fascinating. And one of the things I started to really look at while I was in Central America and in the Dominican Republic was the religious culture of these places. Because Honduras, of course, you know, traditionally Catholic country, but I was also assigned to a site that was right next to a huge set of Mayan ruins, Ruinas de Copan, which is just a fantastic site. It's one of the most amazing places on the face of the earth. And just to be able to go there and wander around and speculate about, well, how did these people see the world? You know, what was their worldview? How did they get through the day? And that was just tremendously eye-opening. So on the one hand, I had this Catholic culture, which I found fascinating, being this, you know, marginally Protestant kid from, you know, Santa Clara Valley in California and being put into this very devout, kind of pious Catholic culture. I found that really fascinating. And then to have the Mayan overlay or underlay, I guess, just intrigued me that much more. And then I go to the Dominican Republic, which is also you know, a traditionally Catholic country, but a different kind of Catholicism, much more of a kind of Caribbean Catholicism. And the first place they sent me was a little town called Bayaguana. And it was off in the cane fields. And a large part of its population were Haitians. And they, of course, were practicing not only Catholicism, but also voodoo. And that I found absolutely fascinating because, you know, I had all the stereotypes of, you know, Americans about what voodoo was all about and had no idea that it was a incredibly rich and vibrant tradition. So I learned a little bit about that. And so that's what really turned me on to the study of religion. Now, coming back to the States, I still didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I went and got a master's in Spanish at a little place called Monterey Institute of International Studies, which was a wonderful time. And I, at that point, started reading the Spanish mystics, the Golden Age mystics, Santa Teresa and St. John of the Cross, and trying to do my own translations of that material, which was incredibly challenging and fun. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to devote my life to the study of religion. And that's when I applied to the program at UC Santa Barbara, and that's where I got my PhD. 
Right so, on. yeah, it wasn't a straight, straightforward path. And it's certainly not what my parents thought I was going to wind up doing. <laughs> <laughs> what did they think you were going to do? Well, my father was an engineer and my mother was a school teacher. And they were very much interested in me getting a good job that would, you know, pay my way so I wouldn't yeah. wind up in their basement. Yeah. <laughs> and when I decided to go off and study religious studies, it was like, okay, we'll see how this turns out. They were always very supportive, very supportive. But it wasn't a path that they were interested in or that they really understood. My father rejected religion almost completely. And my mother was kind of semi-devout, but she followed my father. So we never had any kind of religious or spiritual upbringing in the, in the home. So for them, this was just completely foreign. It was like, what happened to him? You know, <laughs> where did he go off the rails? Yeah. It's so interesting to me to hear you share about, you know, the, your experience with these, you know, Catholicism, but also the local or maybe with the Mayan, you know, the historical religious influence in these locations and to know that it doesn't matter, right? The geography or the time that this seems to be an essential need for human beings is this sense of connection with community that often comes with it and things like that. And I remember just a few years ago, I had the chance to hear a professor of religious studies speak and he framed it in a way that I had never thought of before, but made so much sense when he said, if you really want to relate well with people, it's essential to understand their religious views because it informs their idea of where they came from, where they're going, how to conduct themselves while they're here. And I thought that makes a lot of sense. And then he proceeded to explain, you know, in a very academic way about how so few of us really understand our own religions, you know, let alone other people's religions. Well, I, yeah, I guess at a certain level, I mean, my take on that is, you know, if your religious path or your spiritual path or whatever path you're on works for you, then I think you understand it well enough. Now, on the other hand, the historic religious traditions, the world religions are so rich and there's such interesting history and theology and philosophy that people have developed that if you take a deep dive it really does help you, I think, to better understand not only the world around you and the way people have perceived it, but also your own ideas of the world. Now, is that absolutely necessary to live a successful life? You know, that kind of deep dive? Maybe not. But it's like art. You know, it adds that extra dimension that just adds a richness that makes things just that much more fun, I guess. Yeah, no, I can see that. Let me ask you now, let me turn the discussion to one about your latest book, John E. Fetzer and the Quest for the New Age. So this was a book that I became aware of, as I mentioned before we started recording, through the HeartMath Institute, who, you know, they sent me an email. They said, this book has been published. It's a biography of this businessman who's no longer with us, John E. Fetzer. And I'll just, from there, invite you to share, Brian, why did you write this book? Why did you pick, you know, and maybe in some ways books pick us, right? But why were you willing to devote however much time, however many years it took to research and write this book? One of the things I got really interested in about 20 years ago was how creative individuals create their own worldviews and create their own worldviews with imagination and conviction, which for most of us, that's kind of difficult. Usually there are worldviews that we accept or inherit or, you know, we basically take on our parents and adapt ourselves to those. But there are some creative individuals out there that, you know, have the wherewithal to actually create their own vision of the universe. You know, Emerson used to talk about creating your own relation to the universe. And I think that's exactly the thing that really interests me in these people that have this kind of imagination. One of the books I wrote before the John Fetzer book was about John Harvey Kellogg. And Dr. Kellogg was the founder of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and he also created breakfast cereals. So that's how most people know him today, as the creator of breakfast cereals. But he was also a Seventh-day Adventist. And over time, he found there was a conflict between his scientific worldview and Seventh-day Adventism, which he found very kind of restrictive. And so he developed on his own a very kind of unorthodox new theology, which he called biologic living. Once I finished that book, I really got interested in finding other people 
who had this ability to create their own worldviews. And so serendipitously, what happened was I'm in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and the Fetzer Institute is located here in town, just right down the road from me. And I'd had some interactions with the Fetzer Institute over the time, over the years. And one of the people on the Memorial Trust happened to read the John Harvey Kellogg book. And they thought, well, we're looking for somebody to do a biography of John Fetzer. Maybe he would be interested. And so they asked me to contribute a chapter to a book they were putting together. And it was about the various metaphysical movements in the Midwest in the 19th century. And so I wrote that. They liked it. And they said, hey, would you like to do this biography? And of course, at that point, I said, absolutely, yes. Because I knew enough about John Fetzer to know that he wasn't the traditional religious or spiritual guy that most people knew him because of his media empire and his business, but almost nobody knew about his very interesting esoteric or new age beliefs. And so what happened was they asked me to write the book. I got a year-long sabbatical from Western Michigan University where I teach and went out to the Fetzer Institute and just about, you know, everything John Fetzer ever wrote about this subject is contained in their archives in their basement. So I got the privilege of, of just sitting there day after day after day, going through these files, reading this material that John Fetzer had generated over time. And he had a real remarkable sense of himself because he saved everything going back until he was like four or five years old. So there is just amazingly rich material. And out of that, I was able to create this narrative of how he developed this kind of new age worldview, as I call it, despite the fact that he comes out of a very traditional Christian background. His mother converted to Seventh-day Adventism at a certain point, and so he converted to that tradition as well. And that was very important for his career, had implications beyond that. But once he left school, he decided it was too restrictive a tradition, just like Dr. Kellogg, and began exploring other paths. So that, in a kind of nutshell, is how I got the opportunity, but also why I had the willingness to devote my time to the life of Johnny Fetzer. Oh, oh, thank you for sharing that. I love the opening of chapter one, where you use some of John Fetzer's words to open this chapter. And he says, as we go through my life story, you're going to find that the word search is one of the paramount activities of my life. I've been searching all my life, not essentially on one subject, but on many subjects. You're going to find practically in the whole history of my life that I've been searching and searching the evolutionary search. That's pretty interesting because there he's speaking to someone, right? I don't know if that was a letter or a journal that he was writing as though it were to someone else. But did you ever have the sense that maybe he was speaking to you as you were his biographer? Well, I think to some degree, I think he was aware at some point somebody would take up his life story. And so maybe he had that in the back of his mind that he wanted to make perfectly clear, you know, what he was all about. And in a way that he couldn't in his daily life, he made his money on radio stations and the media. And he was very afraid that in Western Michigan, where we are, that if people knew he was exploring these kinds of esoteric topics, then that would affect his audiences and his advertisers. So he was very, very private about his religious search. Now, he documented it well enough, so we know about it, but it wasn't something he shared with his coworkers or his employees, and people didn't know about it. So I think, yes, in some ways, he was kind of crafting materials for the future. He always talked about the Fetzer Institute of having a 500-year mission. So here's a guy with a very long-term vision for where he wants his foundation to go, but also, you know, in terms of the world itself. Let me ask you about one of the experiences, again, that you mentioned early in the book that sounds like it was very formative for John in his senior year of high school, he contracted the Spanish flu, right? And that you include in here this sentence, his words, I made a commitment at that time that if I were permitted to live, I would devote my life to the spiritual work of the creator. It seems to me like he lived true to that, but how formative do you think that one experience really was for him? Well, I think it was tremendously formative. He talked about it a number of times in different places. 
we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. So it's just so, the parallels are just amazing. But people before the coronavirus had forgotten about the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918, which killed millions of people around the world. And it was deadly. And when people got it, their chances of survival were fairly low. So when John Fetzer contracted it and the doctor came and looked at him and basically told his mother that that's probably it, he's probably going to go, and he heard this, that's when he said he made the vow. And I think living up to that vow was tremendously important to him. Now, how he did it changed over time, because I'm sure at that point he was, well, he was still a Seventh-day Adventist, so he's thinking in kind of Adventist terms, Christian terms, explicitly Christian terms. But his search, as he said, changed. It evolved over time, but it still remained the search. And the goal was the same, to transform the world. Yeah. That's remarkable to me. So John Fetzer explored and held a number of what might be kindly described as non-traditional beliefs, right? And I want to talk about some of those specifically Partly because I'm curious, I have a deep personal curiosity, partly because I think it might benefit people listening, you know, to have a sense of this. And partly because I think that for me, there's, I don't know that the word is a credibility, but I tend to look at things like UFOs or psychics, right? Or concepts like reincarnation, maybe a little differently, knowing that someone that achieved some measure of success in this world right? And as you mentioned already, John made his fortune in broadcasting, but also owned the Detroit Tigers during World Series run, right? And also was a very successful philanthropist who's, as you already mentioned about the Fencer Institute, you know, lives on beyond him now. And I'm really moved by the Fencer Institute's commitment to creating a peaceful, loving, inclusive world, founding on the principle that we're all connected, right? And so to hear that there's a person who's done work that was successful in the world and yet had this internal spiritual life that he kept separate, which I think I can understand in the Midwest during that time, especially, it probably wouldn't have been well received broadly. So maybe we can just go through these. I'd realize this could be like a multi-part, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, this could be a multi-part thing, Yeah. but where to start? I've got a list of questions here. How about if we start with reincarnation. Sure. Right, because I understand that John not only believed in reincarnation, but he believed two things that kind of stood out to me. One, he believed in the view of reincarnation that groups of people actually reincarnated together and would hold different roles within their new relationship, number one. But number two, that he was some pretty important people in previous lives. Right. Will you talk a little bit about his view and your view on his view? Well, John Fetzer came to a belief in reincarnation, I think probably in the 1930s after being exposed to theosophy. Now, he, before that, he explored spiritualism because he was very interested in getting in touch with his father who died when John Fetzer was very, very young. And so he went to a place called Camp Chesterfield, which is in Indiana. It just sounds is, fun. Well, it's still alive and kicking. It's you have know, you been? Oh yeah, many times. Well, three I'd or four like times. to check it out. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Yeah, Camp Chesterfield. It started in the late nineteenth century, but it's still going today. And it's essentially a camp for mediums. And there are three spiritualist camps that are still operating in the United States. One is Lilydale in upstate New York, which I think is probably the most famous of them. And there's another one called Casadaga in Florida. And then there's Camp Chesterfield, and it has evolved over the years into a kind of permanent psychic fair. So not only can you go to consult the mediums to talk to you know the spirits of the dead, but there's also psychic healing and divination and just all sorts of different you know spiritual paths that are basically pursued there. But back in the 1930s, one of the things John Fetzer did was they had a bookstore. They still do have a bookstore down there, a psychic bookstore metaphysical bookstore. And he would come back every time he would go down. He would go down maybe once or twice every few years. And he would come back with an armload of books. 
And in one of these expeditions, he came back with an armload of books about theosophy and various forms of theosophy. And theosophy, of course, is that 19th century tradition that begins with Madame Blavatsky, who basically tried to marry Western esotericism with Hinduism and Buddhism. And it also is another tradition that is still alive and kicking today. And it's through theosophy, I think, that John Fetzer really encountered this notion of reincarnation, which, of course, goes back to the Dharmic traditions, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. And that really fit his sense of his worldview, his hopes, but also his sense of mission. Because he really thought that it didn't make sense for human beings who had great projects that they'd be able to accomplish them in one lifetime. There was so much to learn and so much to master and so much to know that to reach a high level of spiritual achievement would necessarily have to take multiple lifetimes. And it also made sense to him that groups of people who are working on some kind of spiritual project would also basically reincarnate through multiple lifetimes. So this is something he adopted. Now, one of the things he was very interested in was the Ouija board, and he used it basically to trace his past lives. So using the Ouija board as the medium by which he could actually access his past lives, he basically chased his past lives all the way back to the island of Atlantis, the mythical island of Atlantis. And through each one of these reincarnations, he was basically pursuing the same mission, which was the spiritual transformation of the world, which eventually he believed resulted in the Fetzer Institute. Interesting. So, okay, a couple of things come up for me that I want to I want to explore a little further, or at least comment. The first one I just want to comment on, which is, I have this image of him going to Camp Chesterfield seeing this bookstore that who knows what distance these books have traveled to be there and who the minds are behind them and things like this. But first of all, I think it's easy to forget how special a book is. Yes. <laughs> right. But in the pre Google pre internet era. Yeah. To, there was no find, Amazon. Yeah. How yeah. remarkable that would be. And, and so I want to ask this here before I forget it and then come back to where we are in this conversation. But you mentioned that you were able to get, some great insight into what was what John considered wheat and what he considered chaff in his spiritual search by how he annotated his books, right? Will you talk for a moment about how did he do that? What did he use any special techniques or symbols or, you know, things like that? What did you see that gave you a insight into that? Well, it's interesting because one of the things that allowed me to basically chart the evolution of his worldview is that a big chunk of his personal library is still housed at the Fetzer Institute. And so I could go through these books and basically see what he was reading and approximately know when he was reading them. He would make short notes in the margin, but typically he had a kind of symbol system. So if he thought something was tremendously important, it would be underlined with wavy lines three times. Or if it was tremendously important, then there would be stars in the margins. So he had his own kind of personal system for you know, highlighting those things he thought that were tremendously important. And then if he thought things were not important or he just didn't agree with them, then typically they would get crossed out. So Really? He would he, just cross out the text yeah, in the book? Yeah. Just, yeah <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Yeah. So this is you know pre-highlighting. This is how he basically highlighted his books. Interesting. So, yeah. Okay. So back to the thing about the Ouija board. Why did the Ouija board, how and why, how, why, and when did the Ouija board ever receive a satanic association? Because my understanding is that's not at all what John, I mean, he was not a Satanist. He was not a, right. But how and why in American religious tradition did the Ouija board get that association? Well, I think what happened was the Ouija board really developed out of spiritualism. Because if we go back to 1848, which was when the spiritualist tradition in the United States traditionally is dated to. 1848. 1848. So that's a yeah. hundred years. I always mark 1848 as, uh, 1948 rather. So a hundred years later is the founding of Israel. Oh, right? okay. And, and yeah. I think that's when Mao took power in China. Anyway, just kind of marking time. So, but a hundred years before that, spiritualism begins. Yep. There was a group of sisters, the Fox sisters in Hydeville, New York, and they started hearing rappings, rapping noises. I don't know if you can hear that in their home. And they decided the rapping noises were actually coming from the spirit of a, a dead person. But in order to understand what this spirit was trying to say, they developed this very laborious system where they would recite the alphabet. 
and they would go A, B, C, click. Okay, so word begins with a C, and then they would start over again. Now, to make that process a little bit more efficient, they had letter and number boards created up, which are proto Ouija boards. And that was the original idea, is that these would be used to spell out the words that the spirits were trying to communicate. It then became manufactured as a toy in the late 19th century and was marketed throughout the country and became tremendously popular. Now, a number of conservative Christian groups really worry about this because they're afraid that the spirits that people are contacting are evil spirits and that if you fool around with the Ouija board, what you're doing is essentially opening up some kind of portal to this negative energy. And so given the popularity of the Ouija board, there was this backlash and it developed this kind of notion that, you know, the devil was behind it. So that really goes back to the late 19th century, but it continues through the 20th century. And a lot of times when I mention the fact that John Fetzer used a Ouija board, I get really quizzical looks because one, people either don't believe that it actually works and that's up to the individual, but they also, there are these negative associations to it. Now, John Fetzer himself was always very careful to work the Ouija board with his personal secretary, so there was always two people, and that, in part, was to protect him from whatever negative energies he believed were out there. Yeah, I was surprised to learn that there was a point in his life where, as you write, here's a sentence, a specific period, not his whole life, of course, but during this period... Fetzer made few decisions about his media businesses, the Tigers, and the Foundation, not to mention his personal and professional relationships, without first consulting the Ouija board. I was like, wow. Well, the Ouija board and he also carried a pendulum. And the pendulum was just simply a weight on a string. And the idea was that he would ask yes, no questions, holding the pendulum, you know, straight like a plumb bob. And whether it rotated left or right would basically let him know whether it's a yes or no answer. So John Fetzer was convinced that he himself, although he didn't have mystical experiences, he had one in his life, that was about it, and wasn't a mystic in a traditional sense, but he did have what he thought was a kind of psychic power, a kind of ESP that helped him in his business decisions because he made more correct business decisions than bad ones. Now he made some, you know, bad decisions, we all do, but for the most part, he was fairly successful and chose correctly. And so he would either use the Ouija board or the pendulum to confirm decisions that he was going to make. Now it wasn't always completely determinative whether he would do something or not, but it gave him that added boost of confidence. Now, skeptics would say, well, what he's doing is essentially confirming his own desires, his own decision that he's already made. Maybe that's what was going on. But in any case, it gave him a great deal of confidence. Yeah, I can imagine that. And you include a brief story about a time when he invited one of the Tiger's pitchers to come and have this experience with a pendulum. I think it was Mark Fidrick, right? Will you talk about that story? Yeah, that's a wonderful story. Apparently, Mark Vidrick was a very nice guy, a very popular baseball player. And I, you know, I remember him pitching for the Tigers. And the interesting thing, they called him the bird because he was a pitcher and he had a very strange kind of wind-up routine on the mound. And he would talk to the baseball and his behavior struck people as being rather strange. But he was very good. He was a very successful pitcher. And the sports writers who loved this kind of story just made unmerciful fun of him. And at a certain point, this was getting to him. It was affecting his morale. And so John Fetzer, who at that time, he was the owner of the Detroit Tigers. Typically, he didn't like to get involved in the day-to-day -day running of the team. He thought that wasn't a good idea. Leave that to the manager and, and the coach. But on occasion, he would get involved with individual players. So he asked Mark to come up to his office and they sat down and they started playing with the pendulum. And Fidrix basically said that they did manage to move it simply with the power of their minds. Now, who knows what was going on there, but the way Mark interpreted this was that yes, there is some kind of you know, psychic power, psychic energy going on here. And Fetzer basically convinced him that his warm-up routine, his pitching routine, his wind-up, the talking to the baseball, 
was all a part of basically imparting this energy to the baseball and the pitching situation. So this was his way of tapping in to the universal energies that are out there that allowed him to achieve the kind of success as a pitcher that he achieved. And after that, he didn't feel as self-conscious about his routines. Yeah, it's a great story. I thought so. And as you're saying, you know, whether as critics maybe of John Fetzer and his pendulum are saying, well, he's just confirming it's validating what he already knew or whatever. And to me, this is a similar thought with that idea of reincarnation is, look, if it only empowers you because you choose to believe it, it still empowers you. That's an interesting aspect of it. And as I read this and I thought about his success in business, I did think, man, absolutely anyone who believes that they have a divine mission, that they used to be a certain person, you know, a figure from history, and now this lifetime is to complete that work or something. No surprise that person is likely to perform at a high level. In fact, and I believe you wrote at least a paper about Henry Ford, but I read his biography and I believe he believed in reincarnation as well. Do you know? He did, yeah. He got it from a different source, a local Midwest source actually writing about reincarnation. But that gave, because Ford was interesting, Henry Ford, he wasn't an immediate success. He created a couple of businesses that he lost control of. And he found that just tremendously dispiriting. But then he was having conversations with some of his workers. And one of them said, hey, read this book about reincarnation. And for Henry Ford, it made absolute sense. Okay, even in life, we go through multiple lifetimes to get things right. And so, you know, I've obviously been through enough lifetimes that this is the lifetime when I'm going to get it right. No matter how many failures I have, I'm going to eventually get it right. And so he went on to, you know, found the Ford Motor Company and the rest is history. So in a way, again, this belief in reincarnation, whatever you think of it, for him was empowering. It allowed him to overcome his failures and to, you know, eventually create this just tremendous company that's been so successful. Yeah, that's remarkable. You mentioned just a few minutes ago that it seems that John only ever really had one mystical kind of experience. I didn't recall reading that in the book. What was it? Well, actually, thinking about it, qualifying it, I would say there were two experiences. Now, whether you want to call them mystical or not, I'm not sure. But the first one, I think, actually was. He was a little kid in small town Indiana, and he was at the local department store, and he was in the elevator. And he was apparently fooling around in the elevator, you know, punching the floors and doing just the kind of things that department stores don't want little kids doing. Well, something went wrong. I have no idea what. And he felt trapped. And then he looked up and he saw this colossal figure of Jesus. And he felt that he was holding on to the leg of Jesus. And Jesus looked down at him and said, I'll never let you go. And so he remembered that well into you know his 80s. This was a tremendously formative experience. I mean, it was, okay, he's got this safety net. He's got this cosmic safety net. So whatever he does, it will catch him. Yeah. See, again, such a powerful, powerful experience, powerful belief. And in fact, I'm recalling that now. Yeah, of course, this chapter one, meeting Jesus in an elevator yeah. is the title <laughs> of the chapter. What was the other experience? Well, later on in life, this was the late seventies. He always relied on other people for kind of psychic information and psychic expertise because he thought, okay, I've got my own kind of psychic powers, if you want to call it that, this kind of business ESP, but that's as far as it goes. So he basically consulted other people, for example, channelers or mediums to get in contact with the spirits. But at a certain point, he got fascinated with LSD and the use of LSD, which, of course, was, you know, popular in the 60s and was touted as this kind of mind altering, mind expanding drug. And so he was curious and he knew people through his funding of various research projects who could supply him with LSD under controlled circumstances. And so he took a dose. And, you know, this is late in life. He must have been 79 or 80. So he was still exploring. He was very interesting at this late stage in life. He was still willing to take these kinds of risks. Well, he had a trip, and apparently it was recorded on a tape. It lasted for hours. They brought him home. And he sobered up and he listened to the tape and something on the tape really freaked him out. He was kind of appalled by the whole experience. 
And he decided, okay, that was interesting, but I'm never going to do that again. Unfortunately, the tape doesn't exist, so we don't know what he was talking about. We have some hints, but we don't really know. But he decided, well, okay, I know my limitations in this way. And so from then on, of course, he always relied on other people to provide kind of the psychic information or experiences that he wanted. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Will you talk about his experience with dousing? So I understand he bought a property in Arizona. He hired someone to help find water. They said, there's no water out there, but he found water. Well, yeah, he bought a vacation home in the mountains outside of Tucson, Arizona. Beautiful location and bought, you know, several acres and was going to build this beautiful vacation home there. So he brings in a hydrologist, basically say, well, where should I dig the well? And the hydrologist basically said, there's no water here. <laughs> you could dig forever and you're never going to get any water. And so he said, John Fetzer said, okay, well, let's go see what a dowser can do. And a dowser, of course, is somebody who it is believed is specially tuned to be able to tap into earth energies and locate a variety of things, including sources of water. So the stereotypical dowser or water witch is somebody with a forked branch from typically a willow tree, but it can be other things, who will walk around a site and when there is water located, the wand basically will dip down. So the idea here is that there's some kind of earth energy circuit that's being closed. And if you do this, then you can not only locate water, but a good water dowser could also tell you approximately how deep you have to go for it. Well, John Fetzer called in the well driller and told him, okay, we're going to drill here. And the well driller said, you're crazy. There's no water here. And John Fetzer said, no, if you go down, I forget exactly how much it was. It was 200 feet, let's say. And the well driller got down about 200 feet and was basically, it was all rock. So he was, you know, just destroying drill bit after drill bit. And he basically called up John Fetzer and said, forget it. This is nuts. This, you know, I don't want to waste any more of your money. And John Fetzer said, no, keep going. And apparently they drilled a little bit more and out came this gushing well that, you know, supplied all the needs of the vacation home. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty remarkable. Okay. So I think I just have a few more questions sure. here before we transition, but in the fifties and sixties, I know John was, he certainly was not the only American who was fascinated by UFOs in that period, but he was, I think you mentioned that he had something like 30 books in his library at one point about this. What was his interest in UFOs and what do you think, what did he ultimately come to believe about them? Well, I think there are multiple reasons why he was really fascinated with UFOs. And I think he genuinely believed they existed. Now, whether they were actually coming from outer space or they were you know, passing through dimensions or something like that, I don't think he ever actually decided. But the thing about UFOs is Carl Jung used to call them technological angels. Okay, so it's a kind of modern version on angels and other supernatural beings that people have basically encountered, you know, over the centuries. But in the 20th century, UFOs kind of served that purpose. And I think that was, for John Fetzer, that's exactly right. And so he was fascinated that, okay, maybe there is life in the universe and maybe it is trying to contact us and maybe they do have important things to tell us. A lot of the books he was reading were actually written by theosophists who became UFO believers. And so the kind of UFO lore that they were writing about has a very kind of theosophical bent to it. And theosophy has this idea that there are multiple planets in the universe that are inhabited with higher beings. And so I think for John Fetzer, the appearance of UFOs, I guess the first one was like 1947 over Washington State was confirmation that this was actually true. But John Fetzer was also an engineer and he loved technology and he was fascinated with cutting edge or what might be called unorthodox science. And he felt that UFOs, if they actually exist, must just be a wonderful new kind of technology that boy, if we could only understand them, that would be revolutionary for the planet and for humanity in general. So I think there was two things. I think there was a kind of spiritual component, but there was also a technological component, a science component to it as well. Yeah, that, that sounds right. And the other thing that I want to ask about is about genealogy. I understand he wrote a book about his father's line and later about his mother's line. Right. What do you think his interest? And he took the opportunity, as I understand it, in both works 
to toward the end to kind of share some of his views, which was interesting. But what do you think his motive was in documenting this genealogy? Well, I think the original idea really came from this idea that he wanted to know who his father was because his father died when John was very, very young. And so he really never knew his father. And so I think the first genealogy book of his father's family, the Fetzer side, was tremendously important as a way of kind of filling a gap in his life. But it also built on this idea that families are our chains to the past and also chains to the future. And by situating yourself in that chain, you make a kind of cosmic connection through family, through the generations. And I think this also fit in with his notions of reincarnation as well. In fact, the other use that he made of the Ouija board was back in the day when he started this stuff in the 40s and 50s, there wasn't Ancestry.com or genealogy websites that make it so easy. He had to actually go out and physically look for the documentation himself. And sometimes, he said, he would run into dead ends and he would sit down with the Ouija board and the Ouija board would give him clues to where to look next. And Fetzer claimed that oftentimes it gave him good information and he could pick up the trail and then, you know, basically chase his family farther back into history. Yeah. That's pretty remarkable. It is. It is. And then his mother's side of the family, he also wanted to make that kind of connection as well and create that kind of, you know, chain of memory, if you will, that he was a part of. He never had any children himself. So that also might have been part of the reason why he was so fascinated with genealogy. He knew that the Fetzer line through him was not going to progress, but it would in other branches of the family. And so I think that was tremendously important. The other thing is, you mentioned, these were privately published. They're meant to be given as Christmas gifts to you know members of the family. He sold a few copies, but this was not meant to be a public project that would be sold at bookstores or nobody would be particularly interested. But he did take the opportunity in the last few chapters of each of the book to sketch out his worldview so far. And so in the first one, which was published in the early 60s, the Fetzer book, he talked about a variety of themes that were tremendously important to him. At that point, he was very interested in psychology. And then in the 70s, when he published the second one, he added on a series of chapters that he called collectively America's Agony. And he was basically looking back at the kind of upheavals in the 1960s and what they meant. And he really felt that this was a transition point. This was a terribly important point in not only American history, but world history that pointed to some greater kind of spiritual transformation. And even though he was this very conservative businessman, probably voted Republican, he nevertheless felt that the student protesters, the people who were out on the streets in the 1960s, had a point that life was becoming too materialistic, that the goals were becoming perverted, and that we really needed to put ourselves back on a more spiritual path. And so that was the goal of America's Agony, to kind of sketch out his program, what he wanted to see done. Yeah, you know, and I didn't live through that time but I feel like I got a little bit of a new perspective as you cite his words here when you say, it was no wonder, Fetzer wrote, that students were revolting against the establishment since it represented to them nothing more than institutionalized war, poverty, depersonalization, overpopulation, environmental degradation, racism, and materialism. There you go. I'm like, that sounds a lot like today. <laughs> That's right. Well, those problems are still with us. Yeah. yeah, we're still dealing with them, but they're not new. You know, yeah. people back in the 60s and 70s had the wisdom to see that these were things we we're going to have to overcome if we're going to reach the next level. And again, this is one I think that maybe today here, 50, 60 years later, we might not fully appreciate is being so close to what I might even use the word horror of the atomic era, like having seen that weapon deployed on civilians. Yes. You know, yes. and wondering what does the future hold? Is there a future, you know? Well, the environmental situation we find ourselves in is essentially the new kind of atomic bomb that we're facing. Now, you know, we're still facing problems of nuclear bombs out there, but even more pressing is environmental degradation. So, yeah. So the last two, man, there's so many questions. So the last <laughs> three, I think I want to ask before we transition and, and you can tell. I'll just say them all and you can answer any of them or, or whatever. I wonder if there's anything about John's participation in 
I don't know what the term is, masonry, being a mason, that's interesting or worth commenting on. But that's one. Number two is I definitely want to, would love to have you speak a bit about the Fetzer Institute today, knowing, you know, here's a man, his work leading up to it. And then the last thing is, is there anything else that we haven't touched on about John or his life or work or beliefs or anything that you feel might be worth commenting on? So that's where we are. Well, Freemasonry was actually for a time very, very important to John Fetzer. You know, he made it all the way to the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite Masonry. And I think at some level, he really enjoyed the ritual of it. But it was also a place in the Midwest where you could actually explore metaphysical topics because the symbolism of Freemasonry was steeped in all sorts of, you know, Christian, Islamic, Jewish, Western esoteric meanings. And so here was a place that you could actually explore these things, that we were encouraged to explore them in what was a very religiously conservative environment outside the Masonic Hall. He also liked the idea of the privacy of it, I think. And so I think that was a very important part. And then, of course, the fellowship. You know, he loved his fellow Lodge brothers. I mean, most people, I think most men who were Freemasons went for the fellowship. He did as well. Yeah. But there it's, was it's an, val is valuable, right? Yeah. I don't know much about the Freemasons, but I've read something. Obviously, if, if you Google, it's easy to find a lot of conspiracy type things. But I've read that almost, I don't know, maybe like three quarters of the United States presidents have been Masons. That's pretty oh, amazing. It was tremendously popular. It was very popular among many of the founding fathers and kind of the aristocracy of early America. And then it was attacked as a secret conspiracy and almost disappeared from the landscape in the United States in the 19th century. There was a political party that was called the Anti-Masonic Party that was you know, determined to get rid of it. It overcame that. And after the Civil War, it became this tremendously powerful and popular institution in America. But there was an explosion of all sorts of fraternal organizations in the United States at that time. But into the 20th century, it continued on being tremendously important. And I think primarily not only for fellowship, but also, you know, networking. I mean, this was pre-LinkedIn, you know, and this is kind of LinkedIn for the late 19th, early 20th century. This is where you made your contacts. And it didn't matter, you know, where you came from, you know, rich or poor, you know, if you could meet the minimum requirements, you could be a Freemason. Okay, so on to the next question there. And I'm realizing these questions, they just proliferate. But what would you say about the Fetzer Institute today? Like, where has all of this man's life and work led? What is this about? Yeah, the Fetzer Institute has evolved over time. When John Fetzer created it, he actually created it in the 1950s, but didn't do much with it until the 1970s. And at that point, he was tremendously interested in psychical research. So research into ESP, telepathy, telekinesis, remote viewing, those kinds of things. And so he used the Fetzer Foundation money to underwrite projects along these lines. And then late 1970s and into the 80s, he became very interested in alternative medicine, and especially medicine based on the idea of subtle energies. So the idea that human bodies basically are coursing with subtle energies, life force, vitality, you know, prana, chi, whatever you want to call it. And that if we could technologically tap into that, we could diagnose and cure disease. And so that was a big part of it. He was very interested in that. He worked with the Edgar Casey Foundation on projects along these lines. That lasted until his death in 1991, and at that point, the Fetzer board decided it wanted to move in more mainstream directions. And so during most of the 1990s, it was very interested in alternative medicine, but what we might want to call more traditional alternative medicine. So one of the things they did was they underwrote a program and a book by Bill Moyers called Healing with the Mind. And for a lot of Americans, this was their first real exposure to, for example, acupuncture or biofeedback and things like this. And then after 9-11, the Institute evolved again away from the exclusive focus on alternative medicine to a kind of more expansive vision that we really need to create. The mission statement is create the spiritual foundation for a loving world, to create a condition in which love and forgiveness becomes part of the background of being human. 
And so they've basically pioneered a number of programs over the years to promote this kind of vision. And just as an example, this is a relatively recent one. They have something called the Democracy Project. And the whole idea of the Democracy Project is to bring together diverse groups of people from all over the political spectrum, left and right, and to have conversations about, well, what are the spiritual roots of democracy? You know, what underlies it? What are the kinds of things that at a very deep level we can agree on? And the idea here is that once left and right, people, you know, begin to realize, okay, we recognize these spiritual roots of democracy, then we can build more constructive conversations out of that. So those are the kinds of programs that the Fetzer Institute today is basically promoting. That's great. So here I'll ask a personal question related to this book. How did researching this and writing this, and this assumes it did, maybe it didn't, but how did researching and writing this book change you personally? Usually, you know, when people kind of ask me about my spiritual path, I kind of deflect it a little bit by saying that, you know, my religion is comparative religion. Yeah, I still remain fairly agnostic about the things I study. Very open to them. I myself have never had a psychic experience, but would love to if that were possible. So I keep an open mind. And again, it's getting back to the idea that we need to understand people before judging them. So one of the things this project has done for me is it's allowed me to explore a variety of kind of spiritual currents that most people would just completely write off as crazy pseudoscience or whatever. And to see them through the eyes of somebody who really respected them, and as we talked about before, who found them empowering. And I found that tremendously useful. Now, I don't accept most of them, but on the other hand, I understand why somebody would and how they could actually fit into this person's spiritual worldview. So for me, it's been, as all my studies have been, it's expanding. It's expanding my understanding of the possibilities of being spiritual in the world. I admire your ability to do that because this was actually a question I debated asking the next question here. Part of it is I'm not sure how to formulate the question, but it's about how you relate certain events, right? As I don't want to say factual, but without saying allegedly, or this purportedly happened, or right, you just related it as though the person who believed it was relating it. And that might be a question that's better for the writing section, like how did you, you know, formulate, but, but maybe you could just talk about that for a moment. How did you allow yourself the distance to write it as though it were maybe in the words of the subject that you were discussing? Well, I think, again, people have commented on that, that I tried very hard to be neutral in my depictions of it, because the minute you start saying supposedly or allegedly or claimed or that kind of thing, then immediately you're basically distancing yourself from your subject and also judging your subject. So I knew if I was going to do this and really understand this person, I couldn't do that. And as far as I could, I had to enter into the mind of John Fetzer and understand the world through his eyes. And the only way I could do that was to write it in this specific way. The other thing is I had to worry about audience. It's for a general audience. I mean, people outside the Fetzer Institute who read this, but also for people who are in the Institute and their people as well. And so, again, I, you know, it was meant to be as factual and as neutral as I possibly could. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so then this is the last question in this section. What, if anything else, haven't we covered that might be worth discussing in your view about John, about his life, his work, this book, the Fetzer Institute, anything else? Well, one of the really interesting things I found about John Fetzer was that he was a man with a plan. And, you know, he, beginning in the 30s and 40s, he built his broadcasting empire. 1950s, he continues expanding his broadcast business, tremendously successful, gets together a consortium of people to buy the Detroit Tigers, and then eventually by 62, he buys them all out, so he's the sole owner of the Detroit Tigers. So here's a guy who's incredibly successful businessman, incredibly rich. But then, throughout all this, he was always asking himself, well, what am I going to do with this? I have all this money. What do I do with it? How do I serve? Getting back to his pledge, his vow, when they thought he was going to die of the Spanish flu in 1918. 
And I think he long had it in the back of his mind that he was going to create a foundation in order to promote his vision for the spiritual transformation of the world. And so in the 1970s, he began very systematically to liquidate his businesses in order to build up the endowment for what was then called the Fetzer Foundation. It's now called the Fetzer Institute. And he completed that process well before he passed away in the middle of the 1980s. He sold the Detroit Tigers. Very difficult decision at some level, very easy decision at another level, but he knew this was going to be his legacy to the world for the next 500 years. And so he wasn't afraid of getting free of or turning loose his business interests. For a lot of people who've spent a lifetime building something, the last thing they want to do is, is lose it. And it's very difficult. But for him, and this I find just really remarkable, he did it. He said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And he systematically did it and creating the endowment for the Fetzer Institute. And I just find that remarkable. I don't think that happens too often. Yeah, it is remarkable. I mean, especially where it can be so hard just to know what to do with a weekend or you know, a summer <laughs> vacation. And here's someone who's yeah. got a 500 year plan for their institute. And, yeah, you know, thinking on a this. whole different plane. Yeah, it truly is next level thinking. That's cool. Well, with your permission, let's go ahead and transition to the enlightening lightning round. Okay. Okay. I'll do my so, best. Again, a series of questions on a variety of topics. For the most part, I'll endeavor to simply ask the question and stand aside. You're welcome to answer however long feels right to you. Okay. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a... Again, I have to say life is a mystery to be solved. And it's a mystery that will never be solved. And so again, it's the journey, the attempt to solve it, the various ways of trying to solve it. I think that's what life is all about. It's a puzzle. Life is a puzzle to be solved, but we know that we'll never solve it. Maybe, you know, if reincarnation is true, maybe at some further lifetime down the way we will. But that's what gives life its richness and its kind of urgency and its beauty is the fact that there are parts of it that are tremendously ambiguous and puzzling and we have to figure it out. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Question number two. Here I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's famous question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Very important truth. Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. I guess for me, the truth is that, again, getting back to the puzzle that can't be solved, you can live a perfectly good life, a rich life, knowing that it's going to remain ambiguous to the end. And for a lot of people, that's difficult to take. It's like, no, there's got to be a reason. There's got to be a point. There's got to be a solution. There's got to be, even if we're only find out in the afterlife. Yeah. And I don't think we necessarily will. You know, the universe is a vast place. There might be an intelligence behind it. Is it really, you know, working to our benefit or... How is it interconnecting with our lives? Are our values its values? I have no idea. And I don't think we as human beings can actually solve that. There's a limit, unfortunately, to human knowledge. And I think that's a truth that people don't like to face. Yeah, I can see that. All right, question number three. This one might be a stretch, I acknowledge, but please just go with me on it. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Well, there is a poster at the university that I really liked. And it is, it basically says that other cultures are not failed attempts at being you. <laughs> I love and that. And I love that. Yeah. You know, because there are a variety of different ways of living successful lives and it might not look like yours. And I think that's an important thing, especially for the time period now when we're dealing with a situation in which we really have to interact with the rest of the planet in a just way. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Other cultures are not failed attempts at being you. That brings to mind something I once heard Tony Robbins say about women often think that men are just hairy women who need coaching. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do look at, we have, we're born with certain categories in our mind and we try and impose them on the world. That's right. And we have to realize again, there are limits to that. For sure. And costs. There's benefits to be sure. But sure. Costs. Yeah. Okay. Question number four. So what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? I really like Karen Armstrong's The Great Transformation. And it's a book about something called the Axial Age. 
And it's actually a book I've given to a number of my students. And what it talks about is the axial age is the essentially period of time in the middle of the first millennium BC or BCE, when there was a kind of wholesale transformation of consciousness that occurred in multiple cultures from China to, as far as we know, the Americas. We don't know enough about the Americas to say that, but at least, you know, Greece, ancient Israel, China, India, the rise of Buddhism. And that's a really interesting question. So, you know, consciousness before that was very collectivist. After that, consciousness becomes more individualized and the idea of individual ethical duties becomes profoundly important. And I think we're in a position where we actually need a third kind of spiritual revolution like that, which brings those two things back together, the collective and the individual. But if you don't know about that first one that happened so many years ago, you know, I think it's a clue to what we need to do in the world. So that's why I like Karen Armstrong's The Great Transformation. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. What are you reading right now? So I'm plowing my way through Emerson's collected works. And I just find it absolutely fascinating. He is essentially the father of American spirituality. And so many of his ideas get transmuted into all sorts of different new religious movements and spiritual currents that are still with us today. Now, a lot of things he said was very problematic. You know, he's a creature of his time. So I think that's fascinating. The project I'm working on is in 1871, he took a trip to California. So I'm writing a kind of travelogue about that trip, which was just absolutely fascinating. So I'm reading a number of the kind of standard biographies of Ralph Waldo Emerson, in addition to the collected works. And it's been a treat. I've never had the opportunity to actually sit down and just plow my way through a body of work as rich as Emerson's. Awesome. Well, thank you. Okay. Question number five. So this question is about travel. When you travel, is there something you do or something you take with you to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? One thing I always do is carry a journal. Yeah. And I don't normally journal on a daily basis, but I do when I travel. And it does a number of things. It slows you down. It allows you to reflect and think about the things that you've seen and experienced. So often when we travel, we're restricted on time. And the whole idea is to see as many things, to cram as many experiences in as possible. And that could be really counterproductive. And the thing I find with the journal that makes trips that much more interesting to me is that taking 15 minutes at the end of the day to basically write things down and think about them makes the trip just so much more rich for me. And then, of course, years later, you go back and you look at these things and you said, wow, I did this, I did that. And that's always a fun experience as well. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it amazing what we forget, but then what we recall when we read and how memory works and the episodic nature that a simple sentence can bring to mind? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's like Proust when he's biting into the Madeleine and it brings up all his childhood. Yeah, just a simple phrase or a simple sight that you actually record can bring back those kinds of sense memories. It's just wonderful. That's great. Question number seven, what's one thing you wish every American knew? Boy, yeah, there's so many different ways of answering that at this point. I wish all Americans know this at some level, but, you know, we're all the same. We're all the same people. Yeah, at root, we're all human beings. And it's hard because we become so polarized that we start to see people as, you know, other than us, and these divisions are destroying our society. So I wish people would be reminded, they know this, they know this at a basic level, that you know we're all the same and we all have certain aspirations that we can understand and empathize with. So, you know, it's kind of sappy, but I think that's what I would say. Yeah, I love, I love that. Question number eight, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? Making relationships work. Well, there's, of course, the primary thing is that you have to be willing to listen and invest the time, Yeah, which is hard. You know, I find that I develop professional relationships with my students every semester, and it's kind of daunting because, you know, I'll see students for 15 weeks and then they're gone. But still, 
you have to endeavor to connect with them. And the only way you can do that is I have a tendency just to sit up in the front of the classroom and lecture and talk and think everything I say is fascinating. But you have to slow yourself down and give space for people to express themselves and create the dialogue that makes even those kinds of transitory relationships worthwhile and rich. It's hard, though. Thanks. And question number nine, aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you're always sure to do with it or never to do with it? Well, I would take a page out of John Fetzer's book. He basically said money is energy. It's the energy to do things. And if you think about it that way, it's not something to hoard. It's not something, I mean, I want to encourage everybody to save and be responsible with their money, but to realize that, you know, if you die with millions of dollars in your bank account, I would say that's probably not a successful life. You need to use it and use it for good. And that is the energy behind money. I think that's the important thing. On the other hand, I understand how difficult it is. You know, life seems so uncertain that our instincts is to put it away, to save it, to hoard it, to keep it for retirement and hope we actually do at some point <laughs> be able to enjoy it. But who knows? I think the other thing is that time is more important than money. Yeah. You can spend your life basically running a hamster wheel and earn lots and lots of money. But where did the time go? And I think that's a key thing about that. And they say time is money, money is time. It's not. Time is more important than money. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And then question number 10 here, if people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, what would you have them do? Well, I mean, people are welcome to communicate with me directly. I do have a website that's connected to the Department of Comparative Religion at Western Michigan University, and it has my email address. So I'm always happy to hear from people who have read my work and have insights or critiques or you know, criticisms. I've heard from a lot of people who knew John Fetzer during his life, and they filled me in on just really very interesting little details about his personality and how he treated people. So I love to hear from people that way. So people should feel free, feel free. And of course, the books are available. The John Harvey Kellogg book, of course, is available through Amazon. The John Fetzer book is available for free if you'd like a free copy through FetzerTrust.org. So please, if you're interested, go and sign up and they'll send you a free copy of the book. And if you have a chance to read it, let me know what you think. Yeah, that's amazing. It's such a generous gift. And you were telling me before we started recording that that offer is good through December of 2020, right? So just since people listening to this might be hearing it after that. So, okay, awesome. And then I do want to share with you before we transition to the final part of our interview that as a way of saying thank you for making time to share your experience and your insight with me and everybody listening, I've gone online to kiva.org and I've made a hundred dollar micro loan to an entrepreneur named Rosemary in Puerto Rico, who will use this money to, she actually makes boats. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for giving me a reason to do that. Okay, so the final part of our conversation here, and I'll just check in with you. How are you doing? Doing great. You doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. I know we're about at the time that I'd said, but I'm thinking maybe five, six questions about sure. writing and creativity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Where to start? Let me start by asking you about the act of writing itself. It's been a big part of your life for a long time, right? What habits and routines do you have around writing? Well, I actually have a fairly defined way of going about developing a project. And this is developed by trial and error over the years. In my early days as an academic, I wrote fairly theoretical things, and I always found them very difficult to write. And I finally decided the reason for that was I really wasn't enjoying what I was writing. So when I switched to doing kind of local history and then spiritual biography, the writing became so much more easy. So, you know, write what you like. And I think that's tremendously important. But from there, what I try to do is, since I'm so interested in spiritual biography, is identify people who are kind of out of the mainstream, who you don't normally think of as having a kind of theological or spiritual imagination, and then pursuing them 
there, but it all depends on how much information there is out there. It all depends on the documentation. So you actually have to choose people where there is a fair amount of archival material that you can actually do a decent job reconstructing their lives, because that's what this is. It's reconstructing not only their lives, but their imaginations. And so it's really terribly important. So if you find somebody who has an interesting story and has a, a body of information out there that can sustain it, then I sit down and I start thinking about the interesting thing about biography is that it's fairly easy to write, right? Because the person was born, they lived and they died. So the narrative always has a certain you know, arc to it. So that makes it very easy. And then you start thinking about, well, what about that life is important that you want to highlight? Because obviously you don't want to write a 2000 page book that tells you what the person was doing on Thursday of, you know, May 4th, 1844 or whatever. And that's the toughest part. And it takes the longest time to basically come up with the outline. But once that's done, I find the writing process is actually very easy. And then I sit down every day and write one or two paragraphs. And I always leave it at a point. This is something Hemingway said. He always said, leave your writing at a point where you know where you're going to go. Because the next morning you get up, you know exactly where you're headed. Don't leave yourself a puzzle at the end of the day. Puzzle it out and then leave yourself with a place to go. And then I found with the Kellogg book and the Fetzer book and now with the Emerson book that the writing has gotten much, much easier over the years following that process. Now, the problem is you have to have the time, the space, and the freedom to do that, which I know for a lot of people is not. So for those who don't have that kind of thing, still keep writing. And if you can write every day, that's so important. Yeah. And when you say every day, do you mean literally every day, weekends, holidays? Like I know some yeah. people do that. Yeah, I do. I do. Primarily because I know that it's a defined project and it's going to be finished at a certain point. I'm not going to do this, you know, for, but I do try and you know, work seven days a week when I know where the project is going. And of course, it's enjoyable. It's fun. I want to do it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like work. It's amazing that people actually, in some cases, pay me to do this. Yeah, it's just remarkable. So, yeah, the problem is if you break your rhythm, it's oftentimes difficult to come back to a project. So I would not recommend that. Yeah, keep the juices flowing. No, that makes sense. And then do you have a regular time allotted each day? If so, how does that work? And then do you use any other targets? Like I heard you say two paragraphs, but do you have like word counts or page counts or anything like that at which you aim for daily production? Well, typically I try for two standard paragraphs. I'm not even sure how many words that is. You know, that typically it's about two pages, sometimes more, sometimes less, usually not less. And I really find that I'm at my best from about nine in the morning to about two in the afternoon. And then after that, it's kind of, you know, you know, trying to get water from a stone <laughs> or blood from a stone. Yeah. So you just have to pace yourself and then go off and do other things. And of course, during the school year, I have, you know, plenty of other things I have to get finished. So, but happily with an academic job, you know, I have the freedom to basically structure my time that way. One of the nice things, one of the few nice things about the lockdown was that I could stick to this routine every single day. It wasn't a problem. You know, there were absolutely no interruptions. So I guess every cloud has its silver lining. Yeah, yeah for sure. But yeah. Awesome. Who has been influential in your development as a writer and what have you learned from them? I'm trying to think of specific people. There was a writer named Richardson who wrote a couple of really great biographies of Thoreau and Emerson. Since I'm in this Emerson project, these kinds of things keep popping up. He's a fantastic writer because the chapters tend to be short. The books tend to be long, but they read like short novels. And so he's very good at setting the scene, adding relevant personal details, the things that make things really live on the page. And I find his writings just extraordinary. He wrote a book about William James as well, which follows the same kind of pattern. And I think the writing is just tremendously vibrant and fun to read. So I would say, you know, people like that, biographers like that have been my models. That's great. In your view, what are the qualities of a great sentence and how can we write more of them? <laughs> A great sentence. 
Well, obviously a great sentence conveys an idea in a way that is both straightforward but catchy. It strikes your imagination. So it's difficult to actually do that, to come up with a perfect sentence that is both, you know, completely coherent and obvious in its meaning, but also powerful in its kind of imaginative import. That's what you try to do. Now, typically what happens is you write these sentences that you think are just, you know, wonderfully imaginative. And then you go back and read them in a couple of weeks and you think, what was I trying to say there? <laughs> and you have no idea. So hitting yeah. that balance between simplicity and power, imaginative power, is very yeah. difficult. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. When you're writing, what is your sense of connection to the reader? In the moment you're drafting, how does that work for you? Quite frankly, one of the things I try not to do is to think too much about who's going to read this. Because I think then I start second guessing myself. So I write the book that I'm interested in writing and kind of hope that, well, maybe other people might be too. But I think if you try and write for a specific audience, it becomes very restricting. Now, the problem is you might wind up with a project that in the end is unsaleable because it's so personal and so, you know, kind of subjective. But I, you know, that doesn't normally happen. Now, on the Fetzer project, there were certain kinds of constraints. I knew I was writing for a specific audience there, and it wasn't a problem, but I always had that kind of in the back of my mind. The Emerson book, which is I'm doing completely on spec, is great because I get to follow the kind of rabbit trails wherever they lead me, and it's a lot of fun. Now, at the end of the process, I'll have to go back and, of course, edit the project down to something that I think somebody would like to read, um, but it's not something I keep in my mind. Yeah. Awesome. When you are researching and then you move into the writing phase of a project, how do you think of the project from the big picture and the structuring of it, but also the collecting and organizing of material of stories and quotations and, you know, photographs or interviews and things like that. As a practical matter, what tools do you use? Do you use Evernote? Do you use Google Docs, something else, physical files? Like, how do you tackle that? Well, again, with biographies, it's pretty easy because unless you're going to use some kind of flashback format or something like that, which I don't think I have the literary chops to do, then it's chronological. So the chapters in the research are basically arranged chronologically. So that's one of the reasons why I like biography, because it has that built-in kind of structure to it. I'm really very kind of low-tech. You know, I write on a word processor. I have an iBook, and I use Word. And so I write things that way, and then I start collecting pictures as JPEGs or, you know, PDFs or things like that in a separate file. And then at the end of the process, I basically marry the two. But that's it. So it's pretty rudimentary when it comes to technology. I don't like to use bibliography programs or endnote footnote programs or things like that because I think it's so easy to basically lose track of your own material that way. And I like, you know, having it's time intensive. But I think in the end, it creates, what, more accuracy and a greater kind of connection to the book. Same thing with indexes. Publishers always ask me if I would like to have a professional indexer or come in and do it. And it's like, no, because that's actually one of the fun things to do. But the way I do it is so low tech. I basically print out two copies of the manuscript, one's for the names of people and the others for subjects. And I go through with a highlighter and highlight every instance of it. And then I sit down with an Excel spreadsheet and record the page number and either the person's name or the subject, and then do this global sort and then just basically condense things. So it's kind of the brute force method of doing an index. But one of the nice things is once you're at the end of the project, you discover things in the book and connections that you didn't know actually existed. So I find that's a really important part of the project for me. Yeah, I don't think it really improves the book that much, but for me, the author, I find it fascinating. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember reading about the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov's approach to indexing. And it, one of the things, never having done it, I didn't really think much about, but it sounded similar to what you've done. And I can see that there could be a sort of fun in that, you know, seeing your own project in a new way or, you know, something. It was almost like a jigsaw puzzle, the painstaking 
identification of things. All right. I think just a few more questions. One is, I'm always curious about this, the relationship of your writing with your relationship to music and caffeine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How do those factor into your life in your writing, if at all? I love music, but I can't listen to it as I write. I find it too distracting. Yeah. And Even I, instrumental or classical. Yeah. Something. I don't understand how people do it. You know, my students, of course, are the earbuds are essentially welded in. So yeah. <laughs> no matter what they do, they're always listening to something. I'm not that good at multitasking. And my problem is music always makes me daydream. And so if you're listening, you're typing away, and then all of a sudden you're stopped. And it's like, where did I go? So for me, music, I can't. Now, on the other hand, if I didn't have coffee, I couldn't write. Yeah, I, <laughs> I I constantly drink coffee. Now, what I try to do is, you know, brew up the lightest that I possibly can so I can drink gallons of it through the day and not get buzzed at the end. That's the goal. That's the goal. But yeah, without caffeine, I don't know how anybody gets anything done. Yeah, I hear something similar from many writers, for sure. So it's remarkable. And then on the other side, right, everyone has their own preferences and things. And, and then other people, they won't touch it. And it's like, wow. But people manage to be productive in all sorts of ways. So, okay. Well, I think with that, the, the last thing that I'll ask, well, I'll ask this first. Is there anything else related to the topic of writing or the creative process that we haven't touched on that you feel might be worth talking about or might serve the listener? Well, I would recommend... It's, um, there are so many outlets that people can get their creative stuff out there these days. It's just remarkable. And so most of us are probably not going to publish with high powered New York presses. That happens to people who have agents and can do that, but don't let that stop you. There are so many different ways of getting your material out there and read and develop your audience that I don't think you should start with this idea that you're going to, you know, write the great American novel and get it published and win a Pulitzer Prize and all that sort of stuff. You should write what you enjoy writing and then get it out there and develop your audience. I think that's so important. I, I think so. And then, and that might, might have served as well as the answer to my final question, but you can, if so, you could just say ditto or <laughs> answer <laughs> in any way you see fit. But the final question here is just, what advice or encouragement do you leave anybody listening with who is either they've been thinking about writing a book for a long time, or maybe they're in the process of it right now, but haven't managed to cross the finish line? What do you say to somebody in that situation? Perseverance. Keep going. Do it. Yeah. No time like the present. You know, if you put it off, it's not going to get done. And the thing is, once you're finished with it, the next project is going to be so much easier. I think you really do evolve as a writer, the number of projects you do, and it progressively becomes easier and easier. Every book, every project has its obstacles, its difficulties, its puzzles that you have to solve. So I would say power through it. And if your first attempt doesn't really come up to snuff your own judgment, that's okay. The next one's going to be better. Just keep writing. That's so important. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Well, with that, congratulations. You have successfully completed a podcast episode on the School for Good Living. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thanks for Brian, inviting me. I've, I've enjoyed our conversation so much. I'm grateful to you for having written this book, John E. Fetzer and the Quest for the New Age. I learned a lot from it. I enjoyed it. Really appreciate the chance to just talk with you firsthand and learn from you more directly here today. So thank you. This has been a blast. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives 
and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community, get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at briamiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com.